So here is our editing room. When uh, we have any program in any language, in Persian, Arabic, Turkish, English, they gonna editing the our program at this room, and and, and the, the people and our staff is getting move in, and they are working, getting ready, and doing the great job. And kind of as you can see, all of five, six channel, the we edited any program in this room. Alhamdulillah, and it's all happened by your support, by your donation, especially your support in any way. As lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, we all have an inclination to the epitome of love. When we rejoice, when times are hard, whatever stage of life we are in, we all yearn to be in one special place. We all wish to visit the Blessed Shrine of Imam Al Hussein in the Holy City of Karbala. Not all of us have the blessing to visit the Shrine of Imam Hussein, but there is still a way to experience the sights and sound of the blessed land of Karbala in the comfort of your own homes. We call upon you, dear viewers, to support us in our financial costs to help bring the Holy Land of Karbala beaming into your homes. You can support us with a monthly donation of just 50 US dollars or 30 pounds. We are your gateway to Karbala. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Imam Hussein TV3. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salat wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Azimina Wa Habib Qulubina wa Shafi'a Nufusina Abil Qasim Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا يحيى خذ الكتاب بقوة وأتيناه الحكم صبيا 
Congratulations to each and every one of you on the wilada of Imam Al Hassan, salawatullahu wasalamuhu alayhi. And if there was one similarity that one can see between John the Baptist or Nabi Yahya alayhi salam and the Imams of Ahl al Bayt in general, and Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam in particular, is that they both achieved wisdom and authority at a very young age. Indeed, when one looks at the story of John the Baptist, what we realize straight away is in contrast to many before him, John the Baptist was given wisdom at a very young age. This highlighted that to have authority on behalf of God on earth, there was no particular age for it. Sometimes people assume that the older you are, then the more likely you are to become God's leader on the earth. But when one examines the story of John the Baptist and even the story of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, his cousin, you see from the outset that a message was sent that somebody cannot have even reached adolescence and they may still be seen as being fit enough to be an authority for the people of the time. Because many of us assume when we think of prophethood, we think of the age of 40. When we think of authority, we think of the 30s or someone in their 50s. When we think, for example, as someone who's an expert on one of the heavenly books like the Torah or the Zabur or the Injil of the Quran, automatically we assume that that person must be the eldest in the community and that only the eldest in the community can be the person of wisdom. The story of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam highlights that God never wanted to put an age as to who could represent him on the earth. You could have somebody like Nabi Yahya alayhi salam who could represent him or you could have somebody as old as Nabi Nuh alayhi salam representing him. Nabi Nuh may have reached the age of a thousand and may have been a representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Yahya had not even become baligh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to highlight that on the earth this young man who has not even reached the age of bulugh is now fit enough to explain my wisdom on the earth because what is the role of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the one hand their role is to establish justice on the earth and their other role is to make sure that God's wisdom is preached to the people of the earth we look at our holy prophet peace be upon him and his family what do we find we find with our holy prophet peace be upon him and his family that the Quran mentions The role of the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore was to teach the book and the wisdom that comes from that book. A Prophet may be 40 like Musa teaches the book and the wisdom that comes from the book. A Prophet can be like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, 40 teaches the book and the wisdom that comes from the book. But the difference with Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, John the Baptist, was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighted he didn't have to get to 40. He was a sabi, a person who had not even reached adolescence, and he was already greater than all the scholars living around him. Let us tonight examine the wisdom of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam in the middle of the scholars of the children of Israel. And I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, what were the scholars around Nabi Yahya's time like? What were their characteristics? And why does he call them a brood of vipers? Number two, Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, God tells him, Ya Yahya, khud al kitaba bi quwa. Oh Yahya, take the book with strength. Which book? And what does he mean with a certain strength or fortitude? Number three, how did Nabi Yahya highlight his wisdom at that very young age? Number four, are there groups of people who are Ahl al-Kitab who follow Nabi Yahya alayhi salam? The same way there are Ahl al-Kitab who follow Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And who are the Sabi'ah or the Sabians who are mentioned in the Quran as a group alongside the Yahud and the Nasara. Further than that, if Nabi Yahya alayhi salam before he was adolescent is already being given authority by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
then could it be a possibility that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, even before they reached their teens were already qualified to be Imams ahead of those around them? And how do the Imams, including Imam Al-Jawad use this ayah to tell the people that if you question us at the age of eight, why we have the wisdom that we have, then look at the ayah on Nabi Yahya alayhi salam and look at the wisdom God gave him at a young age. Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. When we look at the time of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, one thing emerges that's very clear. The scholars of his time were not necessarily implementing what the Torah was teaching. If you look at the people who were either the learned on the Torah or they were the ones who were interpreters of the Torah, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we had mentioned that amongst these, you had people who looked religious. The beard was the nicest beard. They were wearing the cloth that was the garb of the clergy. But they had amongst them so much envy against one another. They were vying for certain things against one another. They were attacking one another. They were attacking anyone who went against their worldview. In the chapter of Matthew in the Bible, chapter of Matthew 3, 7, you find that they are described by Yahya alayhi salam as a brood of vipers. Now when we mention a viper, a viper is not exactly an animal that you're going to have a comfortable relationship with. Yes. A viper is that which is venomous. That which is ready to bite whenever it gets an opportunity. When ulama in any religion have that type of temperament or that type of behavior where they're ready to bite at any moment, then you know the religion is on its way down. Any religion, whether it's Judaism, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam. If the people who are the scholars of that religion are a group of people who are ready to bite one another, ready to venomously attack one another, ready to look for any opportunity to bring one another down, then know that the spirituality of that religion is completely missing. As in we see, for example, even in the Muslim world today, in the Muslim world today, it's very similar to what Nabi Yahya alayhi salam grew up in, in terms of when he was a child. Nabi Yahya, when he was a child, what were the scholars of his time like? Were they all pious, giving each other benefits of the doubt? looking after each other, looking after each other's reputations? No, not at all. When we hear that hadith that says, Afat al-ulama al-hasad, the virus of the scholars is what? Is envy of one another. It's a phenomenal hadith. The disease of the ulama is hasad and the disease of the businessmen is greed. Someone says, I understand. The disease of the businessman is greed. That I can see. But Afat al-Ulama al-Hasad, the disease of the Ulama is Hasad, of course. The most Hasad always exists between Mawlanas. If you ever want to see the most envy that exists in the Muslim world, in the Christian world, in the Jewish world, in the Hindu world, in the Sikh world, you'll see it's between the priests of the religion. The priests of the religion cannot wait to stab each other in the back. Why? Because either some of them want some fame and they're not getting that fame. They're trying their hardest to become famous. They're trying their hardest to get people to follow them. They're trying their hardest to get people to listen to them. And yet they see that there are others who are getting a lot more fame than them. There are others who are more popular than them. There are others, the more you attack them, the more people love them. So what happens to that person? That person, by the way, can quote you the religious scripture and the narrations of the prophet of that time. He can quote it for you inside out. But what's the point of quoting the book if your heart is a heart full of envy? Isn't that true? If a person now memorizes the Torah or memorizes the Bible or memorizes the Quran, but that same person is a person who is full of malice, full of hate, full of envy towards their fellow scholars. It means in reality that there was no point in them studying all these verses and all these hadiths. Yahya alayhi salam describes them as a brood of vipers. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam doesn't turn around and say, you know what, they're my fellow Mawlanas 
and I'm sure that they mean well. He said, no, these are vipers who are living amongst us. They cannot wait to attack. And sometimes the only content they have is the content to attack. They have no other content. If they had more content, for example, like they've given, for example, a series of lectures in their time on a prophet like Idris alayhi salam or a prophet like Nuh alayhi salam or a prophet like Adam alayhi salam, then they wouldn't have enough time to bicker with others. They'd be too busy preparing lectures with the deepest content. But what happened in their time? They were more interested in attacking one another. They were more interested in gaining the popularity of a couple of people who'll tell them, well done for what you've done. Because what happens when ulama attack one another? Either there's someone behind the scenes telling them that, listen, your role here is to attack so and so. So what they do in the period of the children of Israel is some of the Pharisees, for example, would please their Roman masters. Some of the Pharisees, for example, would be looking to look after themselves, not look after the religion. And therefore, Nabi Yahya was young when he saw all of this. Nabi Yahya had not even reached the age of Bulugh. Nabi Yahya was extremely young. And the worst thing is when someone young sees the ulama fight amongst each other. Isn't that true? If you're at a young age, you want to see the ulama make excuses for one another, give benefits of the doubt to one another. You want to see the ulama being walking Qur'ans on the earth. But when you're young and you see this alim hates that alim, this scholar hates that scholar, this speaker hates that speaker, you start giving up on going to the church or to the temple or to the mosque. Is that true? Because you start saying that, hold on, if these people are like vipers, they look to bite one another all the time, then why am I going to the mosque when the imams of the mosque are vipers against one another? Nabi Yahya alayhi salam therefore grew up in an environment where the scholars of the religion were what? Were the most venomous people. Were the people who were far away. Hence if you notice in the story of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam something amazing happens. The beginning of the story is we're being told about Nabi Zakaria and his wife Elizabeth. They're both old. They can't have children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, and Allah yubashiruka bi Yahya. True? He gives them the news that you're going to have a child. All of a sudden, from giving them the news that they're going to have a child called Yahya, there's a jump. What's the jump? Ya Yahya, khud al kitab bi Straight away, look at the jump that happens. Normally, when a person is born, do we jump straight away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling them, take the holy book? with a certain fortitude, that rarely happens. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is born. It takes years before Allah reveals the Quran to him, for example, or wisdom to him. It takes 40 years. Moses is born. It takes years before he reaches a level where God tells him, Ya Musa, khud al-kitab bi quwa. Or Ya Muhammad, khud al-kitab. Yahya alayhi salam, we're told that he is born, then all of a sudden, we see the lines. Ya Yahya. خُذ الْكِتَابَ بِقُوَّةِ First and foremost, when he's told خُذ الْكِتَابَ بِقُوَّةِ Which kitab? He's told to take the Torah. Take the Torah, but Ya Allah, everybody already has the Torah. خُذ الْكِتَابَ بِقُوَّةِ Take the Torah and lead with it properly. Meaning what? He, how old was he at the time? The Quran says that he was a sabi. We have a tifl. We have a sabi. And then after that, we move into the world of, for example, when someone's called a rajul, correct? A tifl, first few years of your life. A sabi is somebody who's around the age of, let's say, 9, 10, 11. Bulugh normally comes a couple of years after that. Nabi Yahya, alayhi salam, God reveals to him, while he's a sabi, what does he say to him? Ya Yahya, khud al kitab bi quwa. Why did Allah say take the Torah with quwa? It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was seeing that the others who were claiming to be the teachers of the Torah, the others unfortunately were not following the teachings, were not expounding on the wisdom. And that's why you see this clearly where? You see it clearly in Surah Al Jum'ah. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Mathalu al ladina hummilu al Torah. ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا. 
The Quran gives an example as to the nation at that time. The example of those who hold on to the Torah and they don't really follow it. They are similar to the donkey that carries books. A donkey, you get this donkey and you want it to carry a box of books for you. You tell the, don you tell the owner, I want the donkey to take the books for me from, for example, I don't know, North London to South London. That donkey takes the books from the north to the south. I ask you a question. Does that donkey know what it's carrying? No, not at all. Does that donkey, for example, recognize the importance of what it's carrying? No, not at all. The donkey simply takes the books from point A to point Z. Likewise, Allah said that those people in the time of Nabi Yahya, السلام, which also means at the time of Nabi Isa, السلام, they were carrying the Torah, but they were like donkeys carrying it. And may Allah never make the Muslim community similar to them. Because the Muslim community can fall in the same trap. Many of us can become like donkeys carrying luggage, unfortunately. How many of us have the Quran at home, hardly ever open the Quran the whole year? Ask yourself, in the last year, how many of you have read a tafsir of the Holy Quran? You've got the Quran at home, and there are tafsir available in the English language which a person can go online, read the tafsir in Arabic, in English, in Urdu, in Farsi. But many of us have become like donkeys carrying luggage. When we move houses, the Quran is always in a special place. When we go from Fatha to Fatha, the Quran is in a special place. But how many of us have actually carried the Quran properly? Therefore, when the Quran said, What had happened? They were carrying the Torah. But they weren't implementing the Torah the way the Torah needed to be implemented. Therefore, what happened was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted a man to emerge. A man to emerge who would hold the Torah and show them the way the Torah was to be implemented. How old was this man? 36, 48, 57. He was not even 9, 10 years of age. Yet he stood like a beacon of light to the extent Allah said, sabiyya. What does hukma mean? What is hukma? Some people believed that hukma meant prophethood. That we have given him hukum in the sense of nubuwa. We have given him prophethood while he is at that young age. There are certain schools who believed that Nabi Yahya became a Nabi without even being baligh yet. But some replied by saying that no, one of the conditions of a person for them being a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and leading the community would have to be that they've reached the age of bulugh at that time. Of course, some then went on to debate and I'll come to discuss when does Nabi Isa alayhi salam become a prophet? Because Nabi Isa says, Inni Abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiya. So some said that وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ meant that we gave him prophethood while he was still a 9, 10 year old. Those who replied said, number one, a prophet would have to have reached the age of bulugh. Allah says وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ sabiya. This person still hasn't reached the age. Secondly, they said the ayah in the Quran said وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِ إِلَيْهِمْ Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we have not sent before you except Rijal who will reveal to him. So how is Yahya a prophet at that young age if the Quran says وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا If he's a sabi, he could not take nubuwa because a Rijal or the Rajul would be someone who's past bulugh. Okay, that was number two. Number three, sometimes they said that huk would always come next to Nubuwa. There are ayat in the Quran where Allah says, We gave the children of Israel Nubuwa and we gave them Hukm. If Hukm means Nubuwa, so why separate the two? Okay. So some said, therefore, when the Quran said, sabiya, They all agreed on Sabi, by the way. Everybody agreed that the Sabi is the child who has not reached the age of Bulugh. So when we're talking, about Nabi Yahya, Allah is saying, I have spoken to a child 
under the age of 10 and I am telling him, the child, to be the example to all the scholars who are older than him, who are around him, highlighting age has no preference or position in Islam when Allah chooses his leaders on the earth. Sabi, even there are discussions of Sabi in Islamic law. You know, if someone now, I give you an example. If someone now is a Sabi and someone is Balik, the age difference between them may be four years, for example, true? Someone, let's say, is a Sabi, 10 and under. Someone who's Balik, let's say, 12 and over, 13 and over. Al Balik, the child who is Balik, are they subject to Islamic law in every area? Yes. A Sabi, are they subject to Islamic law in every area? Not necessarily. What do we mean? Al Balik, when the Quran says to someone who's Balik, Aqimu Salat, if you're Balik, do you have to pray? If you're Balik, you have now reached the age of Bulugh. Is it wajib on you to pray Salah? Yes. If you're a Sabi and you're not Balik, is it wajib on you to pray Salah? No. So if someone, for example, now your nine year old brother, is it wajib on them to pray Salah? No. Is it wajib on your brother who's become Balik to pray Salah? Yes. How do they know if they become Balik? They may either look at seminal emission. They may either look at pubic hair changes that occur in the body, a deepening of the voice. These all become signs of Bulugh. A Balik child is someone who's subject to Islamic law in every area. Okay? So in the area of Hudud punishments, they are subject to the law. But also on wadi issues, they are subject to the law. Issues that affect day-to-day -day life. The child, however, who's a Sabi, they may not be subject to the taklifi laws like Salah and Sawm, but they are still subject to hukum which are wadi'iyah. What do I mean? If now there's a child out there and that child who's out there decides to make a hole in the road to build something, someone falls over and smashes their head on the floor. Can I turn around and say, he's still a kid, you can't punish him? No, the Islamic court may make their own decision as to what is the ta'zir, for example, for that sabi. A ta'zirat, not the hudud or the qisas, a ta'zirat, not the prescribed punishments, not the punishments of retaliations, but a ta'zirat may still apply to someone under the age of 10. Because someone might come to me and say, bro, are you telling me when I'm 13, and someone's 10, that guy's the naughtiest guy in the world. I'm three years older, I get punished at this one. No, this one still has certain obligations, but not all of the laws of Islam are applicable. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore said, Yahya alayhi salam atainahu al-hukma sabiya. We have given Yahya while he's a sabi. Subhanallah, the Nabi Yahya is so special that even before Bulugh, Allah is giving him something. What's he given him? He, Allah has given him godly wisdom while he's a child. Hukmah doesn't mean nubuwa only. Hukmah means to be given hikmah. Allah's wisdom given to that child. Someone says, but Sayyidina, he's a kid. No. Allah has no age limit to who he gives hikmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants to, he can make a child who's eight or nine sharper than people around him who are in their 50s and 60s. Nabi Yahya, how old was he? Nine years old, 10 years old. Allah told him, you know what? You're not too young. Ya Yahya, khud al kitab bi Oh Yahya, take this book, the Torah with fortitude. Give it life. Let the people feel your energy. Wa atainahu al hukma sabiya. We are the ones who gave him hikmah while he was still a child. Imagine that this Yahya alayhi salam, while he's a child, ulama of Bani Israel were getting jealous of him because of his wisdom while he's young. There would be kids who would be like, Yahya, Yahya, come, let's go and play. He goes, how can we play in this world? This world is not a place of fun and games. There's a day of judgment. We have to answer Allah for what we've done, for the way we spent our time. People will be like, wow, this nine years old is speaking like a 60 year old. If you now went to a nine-year-old anywhere, you said to them, let's go out and play. They'll be gagging to play. When they would come to him, he'll be like, have you not considered the day of judgment? Have you not reflected on the day of judgment? 
You therefore found that the scholars, and this happens by the way, unfortunately, Islamic history, if someone has hikmah at a young age, you find that some of the ulama become jealous of them. Yes? Because if you're seen to be young, then some of the elders, one way they look at you is, Hada ba'dashab, you know, he's still young. Or they'll look at you by saying, he's good for the shabab. This is an interesting one. You hear someone who's young, who's giving deep lectures, they'll say, good for the youth. Hold on, what do you mean youth? You're, you're double my age, you've never heard this content. So what are you talking about, good for the youth? But some people cannot take when someone younger than them is teaching them. And that's what Nabi Yahya faced. Nabi Yahya faced people in his time who couldn't take the house, this person so young, but he's extrapolating so much wisdom in all of his teachings. Question, Nabi Yahya having that much wisdom at a young age, did he gain followers because of that wisdom at a young age? Of course. If you're giving hikam from the Torah or hikam from the Injil or hikam from the Quran, at a young age, people gag to listen to you. People can't wait to sit with you. People can't wait to learn from you. If I give you a very basic example, do you remember there was a child from Iran years ago called Sayyidina Muhammad Hussain al -taba -taba, if I'm not mistaken. He had memorized the whole Quran. That child had memorized the whole Quran. He was like three, four years of age. You ask him any ayah, he, he completes the ayah. You ask him a khutbah from Nahj al he completes the khutab. That child, people couldn't wait to sit with him. Why? Because the wisdom that was emerging was wisdom they were willing to take, willing to follow. And that's why one of the opinions is that when you come to Ahl al-Kitab, one of the Ahl al-Kitab mentioned in the Quran are those who followed the wisdom of Yahya alayhi salam. Someone says, Sayyidina, wait, Ahl al-Kitab I know are three, Muslims, Jews and Christians, true? Normally you hear the people of the book are the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews. The Quran says, no, no, there's more. Someone's like, what do you mean? Quran says, have you not seen that there's Zoroastrians who live around you? There are Zoroastrians in India, Zoroastrians from Iran, yes, Zaradashtiya, some of the Parsi community, they are seen as Ahl al-Kitab. The people of the book in the Quran, they are known as the Majus. Yes? But another group of Ahl al-Kitab, many of you have read the ayah at home. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna al-ladhina amanu, those who believe. Wal-ladhina hadu, and the Jewish, al-Yuhud. Wal-Nasara, who are the Nasara? Christians. Wal-Sabi'ina. Hold on, hold on. Someone's like, Sayyidina, Nasara, Christians, I know, people of the book. Jews, people of the book. Muslims, people of the book. Min in Iraq, we have a big community called the Sabi'ah. In Iraq, we have a community who tend to live by the river Forat or the river Dijla, the Euphrates or the Tigris. They are known as the Sabi'ah. Some people call them Subba. The Sabi'ah have lived in Iraq for centuries, have lived in Syria as well have lived in Palestine as well. Sabi'a, by the way, are recognized in the Quran. Allah says these are amongst the people of the book. Allah says those who believe and the Jewish and the Christians and the Sabians, whoever believes in God and the day of judgment and performs good deeds, let them not fear, let them not grieve. The reward for them is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who? I thought only Muslims go to Jannah. Let's repeat again. Those who believe and the Jews. Uh, hold on, I've got Jewish friends as well. And the Christians. I've got Christian friends as well. And the Sabians. Sabia. Those who believe and those who do good deeds, believe in the day of judgment, Allah will reward them, let them not fear. Does that mean that Muslims, Christians, Jews, Sabi all go to Jannah? One opinion is that Salman al-Farsi had come to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. He was asking about his ancestors. These ancestors, for example, and other companions who came to ask the Prophet, peace be upon his family, they said to me, Ya Rasulullah, my mom was Jewish. My mom was Christian. How many of us know sisters who are converts? True, people marry girls who are converts. Their parents are Christians. Their parents are Jewish. What if I'm in Iraq and I marry a girl from the Sabi'ah? Sabi'ah, south of Mosul, for example. Yes, 
There is a community of Sabia, Iraqis, who are Subba. They live near the river. Why? John the Baptist. So they need to be near rivers, so they baptize their people. They followed Nabi Yahya alayhi salam. They followed Nabi Nuh alayhi salam. They follow the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't believe in zina. They don't believe in adultery. They don't believe in, for example, a person killing another human being. Even when it comes to them slaughtering their food, they do istighfar because they're hurting another of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the companions would ask, Ya Rasulullah, I converted to Islam, but my parents were Jewish. My parents were Christian. My parents were Sabians. My parents were Majus. But they were believers in one God, Ya Rasulullah. Is there a chance they could go to Jannah? The Quran came down. New name, Sabians. The Sabians were those who were followers of who? Of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam according to an opinion. And mind you, in our history, we've had Sabians who were best friends with our ulama. Nahj al balagha Nahj al balagha was written by Sharif al-Radhi. Sharif al-Radhi, his best friend was Ibrahim al-Sabi. Ibrahim the Sabian. Sharif al-Radhi was one of our greatest ulama. His best friend was someone from the Sabian community. Wallah, dare I add that one of the greatest poems written on Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was by Abdul Razak Abdul Wahid, who was a Sabi. Sabi! He's a Sabian, believes in God, believes in the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have a special connection to Nabi Yahya alayhi salam because Nabi Yahya, Allah said, Atainahu al Hukma Sabiya. He was given wisdom. He had not even reached the age of Bulugh. He was already walking around giving wisdom on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This issue therefore raised the question concerning our Imams. In which way? One day a person from the Shia of Egypt went all the way to Medina. People were saying to him, after Imam al-Rida alayhi salam, they say Imam al-Rida's son is called who? Muhammad bin Ali al-Jawad. Up till Imam al-Jawad, all the Imams before him became Imams when they were 20, when they were 25, when they were 30, when they were 35, when they were, for example, of those ages. Until Imam al-Jawad was born, Imam al-Jawad, my dear brothers and sisters, when Imam al-Rada died, Imam al-Jawad was eight. Question. Can a person have wisdom at the age of eight to lead the whole of the religion of Islam? The Egyptian Shi'i came from Egypt all the way to where? All the way to Medina. He came to Imam al-Jawad with one thing in his head. Imam al-Rada, let's say he became an Imam, for example, at which age? Let's say Imam al-Rada alayhi salam became Imam at, for example, let's say 30. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, 33. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, how old was he when he became Imam of the school of Ahlul Bayt? 47 years of age, for example. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, how old was he when he became Imam? 37. All of them were 37, 47, 23, 33. Now there's a problem. Now there's an Imam who's eight. The person said, I came all the way from Egypt to ask the question that can someone be an Imam of the whole of the madhab of Ahlul Bayt? And he's just a child. Which ayah did the Imam quote to prove this? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya Yahya, khud al-kitab bi quwwa wa atainahu al-hukma sabiyya. If Allah could give wisdom to Yahya, why can he not give the same to Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give wisdom to Yahya who had not even reached the age of being baligh, he was still a sabi. So why do you question whether I as an eight-year-old imam can answer all your questions? Now if someone comes, because you know there's some people who say, you know these imams, they're just ulama. And there are these discussions of the theory that a'immat ahlil bayt, faqat ulama abrar, they're just pious ulama. Tell me which alim at the age of eight can answer the questions of everybody around them at that time? Which alim at the age of eight? Any question that was posed, not by anyone. Qadi al-Qudat, the judge of judges of Baghdad. Because you know what happened? Al-Ma'moon, when he made it clear that his daughter is going to marry Imam al-Jawad, there were ulama who were like, wait, you're giving your daughter to a kid? 
He's like, no, 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 no. This is not a normal kid. They're like, but he's a sabi. He's like, how are you expecting him to have that much wisdom as a sabi? Imam al-Jawad turned around, uh, the Ma'moon turned around and said, well, why don't you guys get the best judges? Ask him questions. They're like, what, ask questions to a kid? I said, yeah, kid. Ask him. You guys have studied Islamic law? You've studied theology? You've studied history? You've studied ethics? How old is he? They're like, eight. He's like, so ask him. The Shia claim he's their ninth imam. He's an eight-year-old. Ask him. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi was 33. Imam al-Hassan became imam, he was 37. Imam al Hussein became Imam, he was 47. Now, here we have a situation. We have a nine year old, eight year old. They came to Imam al Jawad, Yahya bin Aksam came, all the judges came, they're all sitting. He said to him, Young man, he said, Yeah. He said, Got a question for you. He said, Yeah, go ahead. He said, What's the kafara for a person who goes hunting while they're wearing their ihram? How old is Imam al-Jawad? <clears throat> What's the kafara? What's the penalty for a person who goes hunting while they are in a state of ihram? Imam al-Jawad said to him, um, question's vague. So what do you mean? This person's thinking, yeah, I bet he can't answer it. He said, no, the question's vague. He said, what do you mean? He said, you're asking me what's the kafara for someone who goes hunting while they're in state of ihram. He said, yeah. He said, ihram for hajj or ihram for umrah? In Mecca or in Medina? In the daytime or in the nighttime? A normal animal or a wild animal? Knowing what he's hunting or not knowing what he's hunting? Knowing the laws of what he's hunting? He went after him one after the other. Eight years old is ripping apart the judges of his time. Ma'moon was sitting back laughing. Why? Because he was thinking, you know the Quran says, sabi about Yahya. Why couldn't Allah give the same wisdom to one of Muhammad's grandchildren? Yes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could give the same hikmah to one of Ahlul Bayt. And that's why when someone comes and tells me these Imams are just ulama abrar, just pious scholars, explain to me the eight-year-old. Others you could say. 25, 35, 45, no problem. But the eight-year-old, that's why Imam al-Rada used to say there is no honor and blessing for us, the Imams, like the birth of Imam al-Jawad Imagine, was Imam al-Jawad the first of the Imams who displayed that wisdom at a young age? No. Before him, there were Imams who had not even reached adolescence. They were showing hikam beyond their years. Isn't that true? You find the likes of, for example, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. From a young age, wherever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would go, he would always be praying behind him. Wherever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would sit and talk to his Lord, Imam Ali would be behind him. You'd see the other Imams, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa while he was alive, he used to say, Hassan and Hussein are Imams. They weren't even baligh yet. They are Imams of this Ummah, be they sitting or be they? Standing. Hassan wal Hussein, Sayyid al Shabab, Ahlil Jannah. Question Did Rasulullah or God ever believed that someone, the age of Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, let's say at the age of six, did Allah ever believe that a young Imam al Hassan at the age of six has the wisdom to represent the whole of the religion of Islam? Did God believe this? Yes, He did. Where? In the story of Mubahala. In the incident of the Mubahala, the Christians came towards Medina. They met the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. When they met him, they asked him, who's Moses' father? He said, Imran. Who's Yusuf's father? He said, Yaqub. They then asked him, who's Jesus' father? He said, he has no father. They said, he must have had a father. Father must be God. He said, no. Quran said, inna mathala Isa inda Allah ka mathali Adam khalaqahum in turab thumma qala lahu kun when they heard this, that Jesus is examples like Adam. If you say Adam, you say Jesus had no father, so God must be his father. Adam had no father or no mother. Yes. After this, they entered a mubahala, that God's curse will come down on who? 
on the disbelievers between the Muslims and the Christians. The Quran said something amazing. It highlighted that Ahlul Bayt, while they are young, their hikmah is higher than those older than them. How? The Quran said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ Whoever disputes with you after knowledge has come to them, you've answered their questions, they still argue with you, فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ Tell them, come! نَدْعُ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ We'll invite our sons, you bring your sons. We'll bring our woman, you bring your woman. We'll bring ourselves, you bring yourselves. Then we will enter a mubahala and ask Allah to withdraw his mercy and curse those who are the disbelievers. Now, when this was done, I ask every Muslim a question. Nabi Yahya had hikmah or wisdom while he was a sabi, while he was young. He hadn't even reached the age of 10, 11, 12. Question arises here. When the event of Mubahala happened, how old was Imam al Hassan, whose wilada we honor tonight? Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam, on the event of Mubahala was not older than six. The heavens did not mind him being six because they knew at the age of six, Imam al Hassan had more wisdom than those around him at the age of 60. The Quran said, Bring your sons. We'll bring us. Bring your woman. We'll bring us. Bring yourselves. We'll bring us. Couldn't Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as his sons? Who does he take with him? Imam al Hassan six. Imam al Hussein five. A six-year-old and a five-year-old on the day of Mubahala highlighted the ayah wa atayna al hukma sabiya that we give who we please or we give who we want wisdom while they are still a child, and that's why for us the Shia. It is no surprise when our Imam, the 12th Imam, became an Imam at the age of five. Some people argued, how could your Imam be an Imam at the age of five? For us, if Allah could give hikmah to Yahya alayhi salam, why can he not give the same hikmah to the grandchildren of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night, the wilada of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, to increase us in our wisdom and our ma'rif of Muhammad and al Muhammad. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst the followers of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Allow us to perform his ziyarah, Ya Allah, in Jannat al Baqi'ah. And allow us to have his shafa'ah on the day of judgment. For all the lovers of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, Ya Allah, remove all their difficulties, all their troubles, and all their trials on this, the night of the 15th of the holy month of Ramadan. Hasten the reappearance of our Imam, Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Fatiha in honor of all of our marhumin, your marhumin, and the marhumin of those who originated this majlis. And we welcome our dear brother Muzammil to come forward and to recite the poetry on behalf and in honor of Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. कैसे बतला क्या है मालासन कैसे बतला क्या
के हर सवाली की झोली भरते हैं कुल के हाजत रवा है मो लहसन कुल के हाजत रवा है मो लहसन और जिसने सिखलाई जंग गाजी को और जिसने सिखलाई जंग गाजी को फख्र शेर खुदा है मो लहसन फख्र शेर खुदा है मो लहसन और जिनके दर के फरिश्ते हैं और जिनके दर के गदा फरिश्ते हैं ऐसे मुश्किल कोशा है मो लहसन ऐसे मुश्किल कोशा है मो लहसन लो जमल में तू को कहना पड़ा लो जमल में तू को कह न पड़ा हो बहु मुर तजा है मो लहसन हो बहु मुर तजा है मो लहसन के हुसन यूसुफ गवाही देता है यूसुफ गवाही देता है हुसन की तहा है मो लहसन हुसन की है मो लहसन बुग्स का सर किया कलम से कलम बुग्स का सर किया कलम से कलम 
अमन के किब रिया है मो लहसन अमर के किब रिया है मो लहसन और जो भी रिजवीन कहे दिए अशा और जो भी रिजवीन कहे दिए अशा आप की ही आता है मो लहसन आप की ही आता है मो लहसन सलवाद मोहम्मद वाल मोहम्मद अल्ला मोहम्मद वाल मोहम्मद is a global issue that needs to be addressed and unfortunately our brothers and sisters are also victims to this struggle. Recent figures show how homelessness has reached figures into the millions. Some people have homes but structural damages to their properties make it difficult to seek refuge and protection from the weather. Iraq has 1.2 million homeless people where Afghanistan has a staggering 4.6 million homeless. Living conditions have a significant role in one's physical and mental health. Imam Hussein Charity seeks to help those victims who have structural damages to their homes as well as those with inadequate housing with our housing schemes. The housing schemes are created to help house displaced families or those who cannot continue to live in their damaged homes. Brand new habitable spaces are created to house victims of homelessness to give them the best head start into rebuilding their lives. For those who have a significant structural damages to their property, Imam Hussein Charity aims to help provide laborers and building materials to fix any leaks, damages, damp, as well as health and safety hazards to provide the safest place for families to reside. Help save a home and families. Just 200 pounds will help fix damages and only 1,500 pounds will go towards constructing a house. For more information, visit www.imamhusseincharity.com. <laughs>